The serial killer is far from a modern creation. We just know more about them today. For example, have you ever heard of Zhu Shanatir? Zhu Shanatir lived in ancient Yemen more than 2000 years ago. He was a wealthy man, but he was also a sadist. He would lure young boys into his home where he would sodomize them and throw them out of a window. Eventually he was stopped, but there was clearly something wrong within him. He wasn't the first and he certainly wasn't the last. Take for example John Williams. John Williams murdered two families, seven people in total in 1811 by bashing their heads in and cutting their throats. How was he able to do that? Not just once, but twice. This is where Edmund Kemper comes in. He is like many other serial killers, but he is also very unique. Thanks to the interviews he gave in the 80s, we have a much better understanding of how the mind of a serial killer might work. And just watching him talk is fascinating. It almost makes you forget about what a horrible human being he actually was. Ed Kemper killed 10 people between 1964 and 1973, but he always had a goal. He was killing strangers as to not kill the ones that he loved. It's gonna be a bumpy ride, folks. So, strap in. Edmund Kemper was born on December 18, 1948, a winter child. He had an emotionally conflicting upbringing. His father wasn't really there for him, but that was mostly because of Ed's mother. She was a very matriarchal woman, and she was very domineering. Edmund did spend some time with his father, but just like Edmund himself, his father's mother was a very matriarchal woman as well. Edmund was an odd kid, he was very socially awkward, but he was huge, not fat, just a big fucking human being. He was also very smart, with an IQ way above average, but despite this, he couldn't really connect with the other kids. As Ed grew older, his fantasy started to peek through, he remembers one instance when he was at a magic show. I started developing the fantasies toward her, from my mother, killing her. And in the decapitation fantasies were even there. They were in, they were in place by then, already. And what were those fantasies? What were they? Yes. Um, possessing the severed heads of women. That when I was young, I was about eight or nine years old, I went to a, this little come on, it was like at a record store or something, and they had this crowd of kids there, and there was a magic show, 
And this guy, you've probably seen it, the fake guillotine, hand pressed, and they put the potato there, and someone puts their neck in the, uh, in the brace, and they slam this thing down, and the potato down below chops in two, but the person's head doesn't fall off, right? And everybody gets very fascinated by that. Oh, my God. And then when he puts the blade in place and he pushes it down, it goes through that neck hole but it never chops anybody's head off. Okay, so he wanted a volunteer out of the, I'm not standing in this crowd watching this show, and he wanted a volunteer out of the audience, and some quite beautiful little 16-year-old girl gets up there, and this big laugh, and they're all giddy and stuff, and I start getting caught up in this. I said, wow. Right at that moment, I departed reality because logically I should have been able to ascertain that that could not happen. You're not going to get away with chopping somebody's head off in the middle of uh, <laughs> in the middle of Helena, Montana, the capital city. Um, but the concept of it was so raw and it was titillating. I says, "Wow, gee, I got to watch this." And he had her girlfriend come over and put her hands there to catch her head so it wouldn't fall in the basket. You know. And he was making jokes about this. I got caught up in this, this, um, this interplay between normal concerns. You don't want to get a bump on her head. Well, hey, if you're chopping her head off, it doesn't matter, right? And this is catching in my mind somehow, and I'm saying, wow. And naturally, everybody let out a shriek, and they're all excited, and oh, wow. And as he chops, and the potato falls, and her head doesn't go anyplace. And he unlocks the brace, and she gets out laughing, and he gives her some little prize for coming up and uh, participating in the experiment. That's the first time I'd ever seen a show like that. You know, you see things like that on TV, it's one thing, but to be there and watch things like that, you get more caught up in it. Um, and I went from there. That became another piece. That's the, that's the only way I can really, the only event in my life that I can align that fascination with. The trick was to have a young lady decapitated, which of course was just a trick, but it triggered something within Ed. The thought of the attractive young lady's severed head aroused him. He knew the thoughts he was having was bad, but he was smart enough as to not tell anyone about them. But his inability to connect with his peers and to be social was a burden for his mother Clarnell. She had tried to help him. But there just wasn't any help for young Ed. It didn't help that he at this point was a teenager and that his fantasies had intensified a lot. During this time he also liked to torture and kill animals. Something very common with the type of serial killer Ed Kemper is. Clarnell just couldn't deal with Ed anymore. So she sent him away to his father. Ed loved being with his father, but with his father came his grandmother, the ruler of the Kempers. Eventually it was decided that Ed was going to stay with his paternal grandparents. It was in December of 1963 that he arrived at their farm. Ed hated his grandmother Maud Kemper. She was very strict and she ruled with an iron fist while her husband sat on one. Ed was at this point 15 years old and he was getting fed up with his grandmother. His fantasies were getting violent and after a few months he started fantasizing about killing his grandmother Maud. He imagined her in the outhouse as he sprayed it with bullets. He also liked to aim at her with his rifle when she wasn't looking. He would look at her through the scope and imagine the feeling of killing her. But fantasies cannot remain as just fantasies for too long. On the morning of August 27, 1964, Edmund was sitting at the kitchen table with his grandmother. He was staring at her with hateful eyes and an odd longing to satisfy his fantasies. Maud was unnerved by her grandson's gaze and she told him to stop it. Edmund picked up his rifle and whistled for the dog something he did from time to time as he went out shooting gophers. This wasn't an unusual or threatening thing for him to do, so Maud didn't really react. She just told him that he was not to shoot birds before she returned to the paperwork she had in front of her. Ed opened the screen and stepped outside. He could see her buried in her paperwork at the table through the screen. 
Her back was turned towards him and just like that it clicked. He was going to act out his fantasy once and for all. He aimed the rifle at Maud Kemper's head and he fired. Boom. And just like that, it was over. Maud fell face first onto the kitchen table, but Ed wanted some more. He fired two more shots into Maud's back. It wasn't necessary, but he did it anyway. Ed walked back into the kitchen where the dead body of his grandmother laid on the table. Obviously, getting shot in the head by a rifle is going to cause a huge amount of bleeding, so in an effort to prevent the stream of blood, Ed wrapped Maud's head in a towel and dragged her into the bedroom. It was only a few minutes after Ed had dragged the dead lady into the bedroom that he heard the familiar sound of his grandfather's truck pull up outside. He never had any real desires to kill his grandfather, but in his cold yet crazy mindset he knew what had to be done. He grabbed his rifle once again and looked outside. He could see his grandfather with his back turned towards the house. He was reaching into the trunk to carry the groceries. And it was at that moment that Ed for the second time that warm summer day raised his rifle. He later described the murder of his grandfather as an act of mercy, to prevent him from seeing what Ed had done to his wife. There was no two extra shots this time. Ed Emil Kemper Sr. was shot in the back of the head, an instant death at the hands of his 15-year-old grandson, Ed Kemper. Ed didn't really know what to do, he was a smart boy, he knew that he could never get away with hiding the bodies, so instead he called his mother and told her what had happened. His mother told him to call the sheriff and that's what he did. Brought into custody, it didn't take long for him to confess. It was decided that Ed Kemper was to be held at a mental facility, a hospital. In 1964, 15 years old, he was admitted and while he was being held in the hospital, formed strong bonds with the doctors working there. He never really shared the fantasies he had. He was a master of disguise. Ed Kemper had something very few people have. He had the self-awareness necessary to make him dangerous. He knew that his thoughts were wrong. He knew how others would perceive them. Yet he still had them. He still fantasized. After five years in 1969, Ed Kemper was released. Many doctors were opposed, but Ed had managed to convince his doctors that he was ready to integrate back into society. Not only was he released, but his juvenile crime slate was wiped clean. Ed Kemper was now a grown man. A huge man. He towered over everyone. He went to live with his mother, and that relationship had a big fucking wedge jammed in. His mother Clarnell constantly degraded him and showed little to no love for her son. The stage had been set. The 70s came, the young pretty girls from the nearby campus started hitchhiking. It was, in many ways, a perfect storm. The thoughts Ed Kemper had when he saw an attractive girl wasn't very traditional. He once stated that one of the first things he thought of was what their head would look like on a stick. Many people have an oral fixation when it comes to sex. Joe Rogan, for example, is a notorious BJ enthusiast, and while that specific part of Ed Kemper's fantasies were normal, it was the circumstance around those parts that made them sickening. See, he liked to imagine the head of the woman to be decapitated. But, so far the fantasies had only remained as fantasies. He had not stepped over the boundaries yet. But history repeats itself. It's almost inevitable for it to happen, just like the fantasies he had of killing his grandmother couldn't remain as just fantasies, 
his sexually sadistic fantasies couldn't stay as fantasies for too long. Ed slowly worked his way up to his first murders. I could explain how he did that, but I think I'll let Ed Kemper explain it himself. Even if just sitting down and talking with the young lady, I need to be able to really communicate, and ironically enough, that's why I began picking people up. And I'm picking up young women, and I'm going a little bit farther each time. It's a daring kind of a thing. At first, there wasn't a gun. I'm driving along. We go to a vulnerable place where there aren't people watching, where I could act out, and I say, no, I can't. And then a gun is in the car, hidden. And this craving, this awful, raging, eating feeling inside. I could feel it consuming my insides, this fantastic passion. Uh, it was overwhelming me. It was like drugs. It was like alcohol. A little isn't enough. At first it is. And as you adjust to that psychologically and physically, you take more and more and more. It's the same process. So it finally came down to the thing of, do I dare bring this gun out? Already realizing if that gun comes out, something has to happen. It was going to happen. I didn't see it then, but it was going to happen. I was playing a dangerous game with a loaded gun. It got us all. Ed Kemper's mother worked at the campus where most of the girls hitchhiked from. And Ed Kemper often used his mother's car. The car had a sticker on it. Some sign that the owner worked at campus. This made it so that even well after the murders had begun, young women still hitchhiked with Ed. The first two were Marianne and Anita. Two young ladies Kemper had picked up. This time he was going to do it knife and he had a burning desire. They were messy those first two. He fumbled and he panicked and the whole thing nearly went down the drain. In that first killing in May of 72, when that gun was pulled out, I launched it out. For, I had it under my leg, out of sight, parallel to my, to my leg in the seat. It was something that had been thought out in fantasy, acted out, felt out, hundreds of times before it ever happened. Kemper drove them at gunpoint to a secluded area near a park. He took one of them into the woods, leaving the second girl tied in the car. i just gone through a horrible experience with her roommate stabbing her. And I was in shock because of that. I couldn't believe that it was that way. And I'm walking back there bewildered. I gotta kill her. I can't let her go. She's gonna tell on me. Everybody's gonna get me. She sees the blood on my hands. What are you doing? She pulled back and she gasped. And I think, whoa, I don't want her to know what happened. I said, your friend got smart with me. She'd been getting really smart with me a lot, but I never hit her. I killed her, but I didn't hit her. I said, your friend got smart with me and I hit her. I think I broke her nose. You better come help. She's about to die. Why, do, why does she have to know that? I couldn't deal with telling her that. And when I attacked her, she didn't at first realize what was happening. It didn't go through. She had very heavy coveralls on. It knocked her right up into the lid of the car. But it didn't pierce the clothing. So it wasn't that swell a knife anyway. I went out and bought a, a pawn shop huge knife. And uh, I kept on it just mindlessly attacking. She falls back into the trunk. I just killed a young woman. I slammed down the lid of the trunk. She isn't dead, she's dying. And I panicked. I thought, I just locked the car keys in it because I can't find them in my pocket. Oh my God, I locked them in the trunk. I'm kicking on the trunk lid and yanking on it. Oh no, I don't believe this. I started to run and I tripped over the gun that I'd had in my pants that I had totally forgotten was there. I stopped, I said, stop and think. I collected my wits check all your pockets. I picked the gun up. I stuck it back in my pants, now remembering I had one. I checked all my pockets, and there's the keys in the back pocket. I never put them in my back pocket. I thought I was pretty slick. 
and went and tripped all over myself that first two murders the first 24 hours there were three clear times i should have been busted and i wasn't because three different individuals or three different groups of people got scared and minded their own business and looked the other way he got them both first he locked anita in the trunk and made it his way back and there he tried to subdue her. He put a plastic bag around her head and tried to suffocate her, but it wouldn't work. It wasn't as smooth as it had always looked in the movies. But he needed to kill her. So he began stabbing her. Furiously, he stabbed her again and again and in pure frustration he grabbed Marianne and slashed her throat with a knife. What a mess. But he still had to deal with Anita. He opened the trunk, and this time he had a larger knife. He began stabbing her too, and somewhat perplexed at how she seemed to just shrug off the stab wounds and continue to struggle, he eventually wore her down and riddled her body with stab wounds. Ed Kemper once said that people don't just fall down and die like in the movies, they leak to death. And that's what Anita did. She leaked to death. He drove around with their bodies in the car for a little while. Eventually brought them inside his home and dissected them. He got rid of the butchered bodies, but he saved their heads. For some time after the murders, he would use the heads in ways that do not occur to most men. Eventually though, the heads would rot and he would throw them into a ravine. A few months after the murders of Anita and Marianne, Edmund Kemper picked up a 15-year-old girl named Aiku. She was hitching a ride to dance class that day. It was September of 1972. Aiku quickly picked up on what Kemper was doing. She spotted a gun and Kemper quickly talked her down. He said to her that he was going to use the gun to kill himself with and that as long as she didn't try to get help from anyone passing by, he would not hurt her. He managed to keep her calm as he drove into the mountains and turned the engine off. That's where he overpowered her, put tape over her mouth and tried to suffocate her by putting his finger in her nose. So that way the tape would stop her from breathing through her mouth and the fingers would stop her from breathing through her nose. She passed out but woke up again as Ed was now strangling her. He held a tight hard grip around her throat and didn't let go until she stopped breathing. After that he dragged her out of his car and raped her on the ground. After he had raped her he decided to make sure she was dead by strangling her again but this time with Aiku's own scarf. Aiku never made it to dance class. She died at the hands of Edmund Kemper and just like he had only been 15 when he murdered his grandparents, she had only been 15 when she was murdered by him. He brought the corpse of the dead girl home and dissected it. After he was done with the head, he got rid of her remains and very little of them ever turned up. It wasn't believed that her disappearance was linked to the disappearances of Marianne and Anita at that time. After all, many young girls went missing in the 70s and many of them were just runaways, teenagers rebelling. But there was no rebellion here. It was just Ed. And no one could see him for who he really was. In between these bursts of carnage that Kemper inflicted, he still picked up girls that he didn't kill. When Ed Kemper was interviewed, he said something I found interesting when talking about these occasions. He said that if a girl began talking to him about this killer that was running around picking up girls and murdering them, that he couldn't harm them. My mother worked at the campus and I had an ace sticker on my car and obvious access day or night to the campus. I was picking up some very lovely young women. You know what we were talking about as we're driving around? Almost as often as not, this guy that's going around doing this stuff. And the second they started talking that, they didn't realize it, but they were getting a free ride. I couldn't touch that with a 10-foot pole, I swear, you know, 
But they'd be telling me what all about this guy, and they're comparing notes and speculating on what he looks like, how he carries himself, why he's doing this stuff, telling me about it. So how come they get in a car with somebody at that time? She judged me not to be that guy. I didn't look like it. What I got from it was that these girls sat down in his car knowing this guy was running around and they were talking to him about it, which meant that they didn't see him as that guy. They were literally talking about the co-ed killer with the co-ed killer. These women basically trusted Kemper with their lives knowing what could happen if they made a bad judgement, something that contrasted the way his mother spoke to him would often refer to him as her murderer's son. That's what I got out of it. But it may have just been an ego thing. These girls talking about him. It made him feel larger than life in a way. His presence was seeping through the co-eds of California. Something I think we need to acknowledge here is that this did take place in California in the 70s. This meant that Ed Kemper was far from the only serial killer preying on pretty young girls or pretty young boys. Ed took a break from the killing for about four months after the murder of Aiku. During this time other bodies were found in his hunting grounds. I'm sure some of these bodies were linked to the coward killer, but he wasn't responsible for them. And Ed was never on any radar despite his troubling teenage years. He was a friendly nuisance. He talked to the cops at the local bar. He even hung out at a bar across the street from the courthouse, making friends with policemen, trying to pick up information. They'd buy me a beer, I'd buy them a beer. Uh, casual relationships, but that was, I was poking around a little bit, trying to find some things out. I knew they wouldn't be privy to hot information, but there were some things that were bothering me, like were there any speculations on how they were dying? Did the cops like you? Like I said, a friendly nuisance. I got in the way. And it was deliberate. Again, friendly nuisances are dismissed. How did you get the knowledge to outsmart the police? Watching television. Believe it or not. Joseph Wambaugh. Police story. Got some tremendous insights into not just the gimmicks, the actual things, the tidbits that you would pick up from their procedures, but the mechanics behind that, the logic behind it was I would not allow myself to walk into even a potential trap. He had also learned a lot of how the police work to catch killers from watching old cop shows. I'm not sure what he watched, but it worked. He wanted to attend the ceremonial burial of one of his victims at one point, but stayed away, fought back his great urge. Because he knew that there would be detectives there scanning the area and looking into the attendees he was getting back into the groove again. His passions were scratching and clawing at the inside of his head, of his entire being. Ed Kemper had a fascination with guns, but it was hard for him to get one because of what he had done when he was 15. He wasn't allowed to purchase them, but somehow he managed to do it anyway. He bought a handgun from a store without trouble, further showing how charismatic and persuasive he could be. He knew that it was a risk buying that gun, that it could risk in police coming to confiscate it. Some police department, now they actually came to your house to pick up a, a handgun. Sheriff's representatives, one of the detectives was upset because he heard I had a 44 Magnum pistol and was a convicted man. He came to take the gun away and it was on uh, he and his sergeant detective. They were staking out the wrong house, it was across the street, and I'm playing around with the car, standing next to the gun, in the trunk. They come over and ask me about, uh, excuse me, sir, uh, do you know who lives in this house across the street here? Well, that house was 609 Harriet. You cross back over to this side and it's 609 Ord, and they were looking for me, and didn't even know that, see what I mean? Bad news. Well, at any rate, we walk into the house, to have them ask my mother about this other house, and I'm saying, hey, which 609 are you looking for? And they said, are you Ed Kemper? Yes, and it goes on. And uh, I needed to find out what they were looking for, the murder weapon, the 22 automatic, 
or the 44 Magnum, and I don't want to advertise that I've got a whole bunch of guns. Uh, so I made a comment to, to divine between the two. And uh, I said, yes, quite a little gun, isn't it? And he retorted, a 44 Magnum, I hope so. And I said, Phew, okay, because that loaded 22 was under the front seat and guaranteed me an arrest right on the spot. And uh, 44 was in the trunk. I forgot that. I took him in the house, we went into my bedroom, and the closet doors open, and I have a high-powered rifle with a scope on it. You had some other stuff in the house, too, yes? Yeah. I had the personal effects and identification of the last two co-eds that had been murdered about two months before, right next to the guns in the closet, in a box. Could he have seen it? No, but when he arrested me for having all those guns and went through the rest of the closet looking to see if there were any pistols or anything else, he wouldn't have, couldn't have helped notice a purse, a book bag, and co-ed ID inside of those belonging to their two latest murder victims. I back up and said, oh, excuse me. I just remembered so. And instantly he responds to what I'm saying. My hand moves. Back we go outside and he's still thinking, boy, this is a really nice and helpful guy here. That same day as he had bought the gun, he picked up Cindy. Just like with Aiku, he drove her to a desolate area and dragged her out of the car. After that, he forced her into the trunk and tested his brand new gun. One clean shot to her forehead. Because it wasn't really the killing in and of itself he was after. He wanted to have sex with the corpses. He wanted to fulfill his fantasies. All he wanted to shut up his mother for good. But for now Cindy had to make do. She got a quick death, a bullet to the head lodged inside her skull. After that Camper drove home and waited for his mother to leave. After she left he brought the dead girl to the bathtub and had sex with her corpse. Afterwards he dissected her, threw the body parts off a cliff and buried her head in his backyard. The body parts were found within the day of him disposing them, but he wasn't worried. He had washed off any trace he could have left, and he had taken out the bullet that was lodged in her head. He didn't make mistakes anymore, and he had gotten more used to killing. He was getting really good at it, and he was getting a lot more dangerous. It was on February 5th, 1973. One month after the murder of Cindy, that Ed Kemper stormed out of his home after an intense argument with his mother. He was furious and started driving around. That's when he saw Rosalind standing by the side of the road. She was hitching a ride and Ed Kemper graciously responded by picking her up. He drove with her for a little bit when another hitchhiker appeared in the distance. Her name was Alice, and while she might have been on her guard, seeing Rosalind in the car made her feel safer. He had now picked up two girls, just like he did in his first murder. He was still fuming inside after the argument he had with his mother. He wasn't going to play any games this time. They drove around for a little while, when Edmund told Rosalind sitting beside him to look out the passenger window to look at the beautiful view. That view of the landscape was the last thing Rosalind ever saw. Edmund drew his gun and shot her in the head and then quickly fired at Alice in the back seat. He shot Alice several times but she wouldn't die. I. But even though she wasn't dead yet he was sure that she wouldn't be able to get out of the car and again Ed was right. He had gotten a confidence scarier than any erratic, crazy person could be. He calmly drove out of town and shot Alice point-blank in the head. This of course finished her off. He drove into a cul-de-sac and carried the two bodies into the trunk of the car and then he drove home. He did his usual thing. He had sex with the corpses and dissected them. Took out the bullet lodged in Rosalind's skull and got rid of the remains. I'm not sure if he had sex with both bodies though. He seemed to have preferred Alice over Rosalind.
but it didn't really matter anymore for him anyway. Because he knew. He knew that this couldn't go on as it had. Six young women had been murdered, mutilated and defiled by Ed. He needed to get to the root of the problem. He needed to kill the person he always wanted to kill. His mother. And that's when I decided I'm going to murder my mother. I knew a week before she died, I was going to kill her. And she went out to a party, she got soused, she came home, went to sleep. I, I was woken up by that, I got, came out, I walked up to her bed, she's laying there reading a paperback, as many thousands of nights before. And she said, oh, I suppose you're going to want to sit up all night and talk now. I looked at her, I said, no. I said, good night. And I knew I was going to kill her, you know? And I'm so cold, it's so hard. And that's the first time in 10 years I've looked at it that way. I mean, that intensely, that honestly. It hurts. Because I'm not. A lizard, I'm not from under a rock. I came out of her vagina. See? I came out of my mother. And in a rage, I went right back in. For seven years, she said, I haven't had sex with a man because of you, my murderous son. It's one of our arguments. I cut off her head. And, and I humiliated her corpse. I said, there. You know, a six young woman dead because of the way she raises her son and the way her son is raised, the way he grows up. And what's her closing words? I suppose you want to sit up all night and talk. God, I, don't, I wish I had. Hmm? That night was just like any other for Clarnell. She saw her son standing in the doorway of her bedroom and made some snide remarks. Kemper was angry, sad and ice cold. So many emotions. This was going to be his magnum opus, his grand finale. He waited for her to fall asleep and as she did he again walked into her bedroom. He didn't say anything, he just watched her, breathing in deep sleep. A sleep she would never escape. Ed pondered on what to do for a little while, and he made his decision. He wasn't going to use a gun on his mother, this was more personal. He instead chose a hammer for this murder. So in the middle of the night, he lunged at her, and struck her in the head, and after striking her, he slashed her throat. She was dead, but Kemper was not done. He wanted to humiliate his mother, he cut out her larynx and attempted to shove it into the garbage disposal in the sink, but it wouldn't take. It just spat it out. Something Ed found somewhat funny, that this woman who had used her voice to pester him for so long, that her voice wouldn't even be accepted by the garbage disposal. Kemper moved on with his plan, cut off his mother's head, and penetrated her severed throat. She had made a remark to him earlier that she hadn't had sex with any man for many years because of him. And now as Ed Kemper finished inside his mother's severed head, he ironically told the head, There you go. Now you've had sex. Eventually the sun came up and Ed Kemper was unsure what to do. He knew he could get away with killing strangers, but how could he get away with killing his own mother? More importantly, did he want to get away? Did he want to kill more innocent women now that what he saw as the root of his problems had been dealt with? I don't know what was running around in Ed's head that day, but at some point he decided to call one of his mother's friends, Sarah Hallett. He invited Sarah for dinner and awaited her arrival. 
Why he wanted to kill Sarah has never been clearly described to me. Maybe he just had a thing for her, maybe he wanted to see if that great passion was still there, or maybe I just missed something. He had told Sarah that the reason he was calling and not his mother was because it was a surprise dinner for his mom. Sarah gladly accepted the invitation, and as she arrived for the dinner, Ed Kemper had barely let her inside before he began strangling her. He used his massive hands and pressed them against her throat, but eventually went and got the scarf that had once belonged to Aiku. He liked to keep trophies of his victims, like driving licenses and purses. In this case, he used the same scarf he had used on Aiku, but this time on his mother's friend. He strangled Sarah to death. He dragged Sarah's body into his bedroom, he removed her clothes and had sex with her body. Sarah was his final victim. He was unsure on what to do now. He didn't want to kill any more innocent girls. He had taken care of what he always had wanted to take care of. So Ed Kemper did something very, very few serial killers ever do. He turned himself in. He told the police what he had done. He told his story, all willingly. He was just done with the killing now, he was ready for his punishments. The co-ed killer was never caught. He turned himself in. Years later he would give interviews to FBI profilers, interviews used in this video, interviews you can easily find on YouTube. He doesn't hold back, and he has helped authorities to understand the minds of how a serial killer works. Ed Kemper is a prime example of a serial killer that can be used to study and attempt to prevent future crimes. He did a lot in that aspect. And it's easy to get lost in that chapter of his life. He is portrayed in the TV series Mindhunters, where they portray this relationship he had with the profilers that evolutionized the understanding we have of serial killers. The same profilers that first coined the term serial killer. There are many sick, sadistic killers out there that should just be put down like a rabid dog. But some of them can provide valuable information and insight. But even though Kemper has done that, we cannot forget what he did to those innocent girls between 1972 and 1973. They never did anything to him. They were just a casualty of his sick desires. His kill streak landed on 10. He had murdered his paternal grandparents. He had murdered six young women. He had murdered his own mother. And he had murdered his mother's friend. Those crimes can never be redeemed. Ed Kemper sits in a cell to this day. He does a lot in the prison. He gets along with everyone. He is still very charismatic and charming. Just watch interviews with him for a while. And you'll see it too. You will see and you will realize just how dangerous these people can be. But one day he will enter the eternal darkness just like his victims did. And when he finally does go into the void of death, he will find no sympathy with me.